Hi, I'm Steve Melvin, Extension Educator with the University of Nebraska-Lincoln Extension, and we're going to talk about how to schedule irrigation with soil water data. This is the second chapter in this series, and today we're going to talk about equipment installation. Equipment installation can be done by yourself, or you can hire a company or a consultant to come out and put the equipment in. The choice is yours. Of course, if you install it yourself, you can save a little bit of money, but you need to go out and make sure that it gets done. If you hire a company to come out and put it in, of course it's on their to-do list and they will get it done in a timely fashion, plus they will make the equipment work all season long and come and get it before harvest. So there are certainly some advantages to hiring a company to put it in, but it does cost a little bit more money. And even if you're having a company install the equipment, I think it's good to understand the basics of the equipment installation and some of the requirements and procedures and things to think about. So please stick around and we'll go through this fairly quickly. This is a diagram of a center pivot field that has several soil types, some side slopes, some ridge tops, and a drainage area in the field. And so the blue dots represent some of the places that we might like to have soil water monitoring equipment. But the real world situation is we probably will only have one or maybe two sites where we're monitoring the soil. And so we need to pick those very wisely and understand the assumptions we're making by picking that site. The red dot represents a place that I might pick in this field. If I had a pivot road coming in from the north on this field, it provides good access to come in and move the sensor out into the field of only a small distance from the pivot road. The pivot road provides excellent access to get out to install the equipment to work on it during the summer if it needs some attention and remove it in the fall. It also, if we can put our uh, readout equipment or monitor right close to the pivot road, it makes an excellent place when we're driving driving in and out to work with the pivot to monitor the data. Of course, we don't want to be clear out at the very end of the pivot because we get an edge effect to the dry land area. And we also don't want to be in too close to the center of the pivot because a sprinkler package during the first span or two of the pivot a lot of times is not quite as accurate as when we get on out just a little bit farther. So we want to be pretty precise about how we install this equipment. Here, if we had a pivot road coming in from the east side, you can see where I might pick to put the equipment. I wouldn't want it down in the drainage area, or I wouldn't really want it up on the side slopes or on the ridge tops. Those areas are going to be drier, and of course the drainage area might be wetter. But I don't want it real close to the edge either. I like to be in at least 150 feet to make sure I don't have any edge effect. We could be a little closer than that probably, but that's kind of the distance that I like to have. So as you can see, there's several things to think about with the picking the site. And if you hire a company to do that, they will probably pick the site for you, but you probably know your field better. And so you may want to visit with them about where they will install the equipment. Other access into the field might be from a waterway or some other location that makes more sense. And sometimes we have to walk a ways to get to the equipment. But if we're going to read the equipment in the field or put a data logger on it, we need to be fairly close to good access so we can get the uh, equipment read or get the data and transfer it out. If we're hiring a company that has telemetry or buying some equipment that has telemetry that puts the data onto the internet, then it's a little less critical of where we put the equipment, but I still encourage you to have good access to it in case you need to service it during the year. There is no right or wrong intervals to install the sensors. It is a matter of opinion, and some people will place them at different levels. Of course, if you have the stack probes that the factory fixes the depths, there's no reason to think too much about it because they're already fixed. However, if you're putting in individual sensors, you need to make the decision, and I prefer to put them in in one foot intervals. My bias is that I'm only going to interpret about so much data, and if I want to monitor the soil to four feet, then four sensors is enough data for me to look at. Some of the probes have a lot of sensors, and then you have to look through all of that data. Some have some pretty good software to help analyze it, but I still like to keep the data fairly simple and as few as sensors as I can. Also, we're going to talk later in this series about a soil water sensor conversion chart, and the assumption based into those charts is that we're looking at a one-foot layer of soil, and so it's most convenient for that as well. Thus, it is most convenient to install the sensors, in my opinion, at 6, 18, 30, and 42 inches. Of course, this would be for the deeper rooted crops like corn and soybeans, wheat, alfalfa, not for the more shallow rooted crops, and there would not be any reason to go quite that deep. And then, of course, only use the readings that are from the sensors in the active root zone of the crop. You know, when the corn's fairly small, we might only use the top two or maybe the top three sensors when we're doing our irrigation scheduling. For this example, we're going to use the watermark sensor. 
At the top of the photo, you can see what the sensor looks like when it comes from the factory. It's a sensor with a coil of wire attached to it. And then we need to install a PVC pipe, and you can see the half inch PVC pipe or the three quarter inch CPVZ pipe fits very nicely and can be glued on. And that way it provides us a good way to push the sensor down the probe hole that we make with our hand probe and more importantly retrieve it in the fall because these sensors are good for several seasons. So you might want to jot down if you want to just buy the sensor and put the pipe on yourself the size that fits. And oftentimes you can find a local dealer who is installing this uh, pipe and then you won't have to do that. You just pay just a little bit for having them put pipe on the sensors for you. So if you want to assemble them, the procedure that I suggest, and again, this is designed to put the sensors at 6, 18, 30, and 42 inches, is to cut four pieces of pipe that are 12, 24, 36, and 48 inches long and glue a sensor onto the end of them with PVC cement. Then come down seven and a half inches from the top of the sensor and using a permanent marker, place a, a line around where it will be the soil line. In other words, you push the sensor in to the, that depth of the soil to make sure that you get to the correct depth that you want. Then label a one on the 12 inch pipe, two on the 24 inch pipe, and so on, so you know what depth each sensor represents. Because after you put them into the field to this line that you draw around them, of course, they're all the same height. Then, with some PVC cement, glue two elbows together and thread the wire through. Fold the extra down inside the tube and just loosely put the elbows on top of the pipe. That way we can remove it to get extra wire out if we want. I choose not to glue the, this elbow onto the top of the sensors. Just press it down and it'll stay on just fine. Watermark sensors need to be completely wet when you install them in the field and it is suggested that you soak them for an hour before you go out into the field. The first time with brand new sensors there's a procedure and in the instructions that come with them of how it is suggested that you wet and dry them a couple of times so they're a little bit more accurate the first time that you put them into the field. To install the sensors it is recommended that you make a hole that is about 7 eighths of an inch in diameter. That is the size of the sensor and we want it to fit very snugly into the soil. So it is recommended that we use a probe that creates this size of a hole. In the Ag Consultant sampling tube that's made by JMC Soil Samplers from over in Iowa creates a hole just about this size. If you're in heavy wet soils it is a good idea to have just a slightly larger hand probe as well and make the hole down to within a few inches of where the sensor will be located and then make the hole the rest of the way with this 7 8 diameter probe. That way you end up being able to slip the sensor down into the soil at the deeper depths easily in the larger hole but yet when you get to the bottom you've got the 7 8 hole to make it nice and tight. Again, as you can see with the labeling, it is important to write on them what the depth is. As you can see, after they're installed, they're all the same height. Then pack the soil tightly around the tubes with a pair of pliers or some screwdriver handle or something which you can work fairly closely in, to into the tubes and pack the soil but not damage the crop. Remember, it's a very important to keep the crop from being damaged. This is not a job you want to do on a wet day when you cause a lot of soil compaction right around these plants. Remember, these plants are supposed to represent all of the plants in the entire field. And they're a very integral part and delicate part of this sensor system, irregardless of what equipment you're using. I always like to get probes installed early in the season when the crop's very small. That way, if I cause a little bit of damage around the plants, they have plenty of time to recover and then be representative of the entire field. Next, then place some soil around the sensors so the water doesn't stand and puddle and run down around the tubes. This is the same with any sensor that you put into the ground. You want to make sure that the water drains away from it a little bit, not a huge amount of soil, but you don't want it to, to run in and pond and run a bunch of water down around your sensor. It'll end up being much wetter than the rest of the field. Watermark sensors can be read in a variety of ways. You can see a manual handheld reader in the upper left hand corner that you can take out and clip onto the sensors and take a reading. This is uh, good to have for troubleshooting or, or taking a check and making sure they're okay, but it's not very convenient if you have to go out into the field each time you want to take the readings and read them one at a time. I would at least suggest that you go with the logger that's at the bottom left hand side. This is a logger. There's other companies that make them, but this one's made by the same company that makes the sensors and it makes it much more convenient. 
I recommend that you add some wire to the sensors and bring it out to a convenient place to read this device. And you can put it along a pivot road or at the edge of the field, some place where you can drive by on the four-wheeler or the pickup and just reach over and push the button and take a reading on the sensors. Seems like most people will take time to do that. The manual one where you have to go out into the field sometimes gets put off and, and uh, for extended periods and we don't get much data. The right hand side of the screen is an example of some equipment that will take the readings, log them, as well as transmit them to a site on the internet where you can download the data onto your computer or your smartphone and have it very conveniently. Of course, the telemetry and this extra website and things cost just a little bit more money, but it is very handy and very convenient to have the data. You can look at it without going to the field, and if particularly like if it rains and you want to see how wet the field has gotten, it's not very convenient to go out through the mud to read these sensors manually, but it's very easy to look on the internet and see what they are. So you just need to decide how much money you want to spend on them, and then if the convenience of having it on the internet is, is worth it to you, certainly would suggest that you go that route. If we're going to use a data logger, we need to add an extension wire onto the sensors. And to do this, we need to strip some wire back. And I recommend that you fold the wires over because they're very small and they can break off fairly easily. And then with the wire folded over, we've got enough material there where we can get these wire nuts to hold on these. We want the small ones. And then with the wire folded back, it will stay on very nicely. And I've had them work very successfully for the whole season. Also, having a temperature sensor is an option with watermark sensors. The temperature doesn't change a lot during the heart of the irrigation season in Nebraska, but it is a good idea, in my opinion, to have a soil temperature sensor out there. A lot of people do not install this. Of course, it costs some more and takes a little more time to put in, and it is not absolutely necessary. So that's one that you can make your decision whether you want to spend the money and the time to install this. Then run the extension wire down the corn row, and out to a place where it's convenient to take a look at the data. When we get to the data logger, make sure and put it in a good convenient place and follow the instructions on how to wire the data logger. If you need to go underneath of a pivot track, I would recommend using a short length of poly pipe or some other appropriate tube to get the, water, the wires down under the pivot track. That way if the pivot wheel cuts down to them, they will not pick up and wrap around the wheels. Then get the logger in a very convenient place to read along the pivot road or the end of the field where all you need to do is stop with a pickup, roll the window down, push the button, and have it the data presented to you. Or the four-wheeler, whatever you're out there with, get it at the right height so it's very convenient to take a look at the data. So that concludes this chapter on equipment installation. Again, the decision is yours. You can certainly hire a company to come out and install the equipment, maintain it over the summer, and remove it in the fall. And this may be an excellent option for some operations. However, if you would like to install the equipment and maintain it yourself, it's certainly something that you can do. Please join me for the next chapter three, where we're going to be talking about basic irrigation scheduling.